Good morning, Claremont. This is Rania Sophia, and she looks forward to meeting you all very soon. Thank you for your cards, gifts, and really good wishes, and we hope to be able to visit our Claremont family soon. Say bye-bye. Say see you soon. Bye. Hello, welcome. Um, this is service for Sunday 15th of November at Claremont Parish Church. I'm Gordon Palmer, a minister here, as well as myself um, taking part in the service. There will be Tom Gordon, who's doing the Bible readings, and John McCart, who will be leading us in our prayers for others. And George Sneddon, who is here on a placement as part of his preparation for ministry in the Church of Scotland. George will be bringing God's Word to us in the message later on in the service. The psalmist says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. Let us honour and worship such a God as we uh, join together in the hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. to join together in prayer, and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the, the Lord's Prayer, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use here at Claremont. Uh, the words for that will be on the screen. So let us pray. Lord, as the psalmist said in these verses we read earlier, glorious and majestic are your deeds. You're a mighty God, a great God, a God who reigns, a God who is king, as we've just sung. And just as that hymn urges us to do, so we bow before you to adore you, to give thanks, and to honor you for who you are, and also for all that you have 
given to us and for us in your Son, Jesus, the Savior, who reigns with you. And yet a Jesus who won sequel with you and in glory of heaven with you stooped and came among us as one of us loved and served, suffered and died for us. And as a Savior, has risen from the dead and ascended once more to your right hand. And we thank you that Christ not just shared in our weakness, but persevered and triumphed through weakness and offered that perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. And we thank you because that means that indeed he does continue to reign. And Lord, as we gather today, coming with many of the hurts and sorenesses of life with and among us as well, We come to say that we confess that you are Lord, that you are King. We come to say that we long for the day when your foes are indeed brought to order and the new heavens and the new earth usher in the fullness of your kingdom. And Lord, we ask that that glorious hope indeed might encourage, might inspire us, might help us to reshape our lives according to the way of Christ, in whose name we pray, and in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. John chapter 13 verses 12 to 17. When Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, 
you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. Well, let me firstly say what a joy it is to be here sharing in God's word with you all. And it's my prayer that as we start this new journey into Philippians 2, that we could all learn something new and exciting about the Lord. Something that would motivate us and draw us closer to his presence and send us further out in his work. So before we begin, let's dedicate our time in prayer. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. By your word, break us. By your spirit, remould and reshape us. From your throne, fill us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. As I said today, we are starting a new series that will lead us up and into and through Advent. And as we go into the wonderful glories that these 11 verses contain, we should get a sense of the wonder of Christ as we see why Jesus came, why he came to shape us, to teach us to serve, to experience our humanity with us, to be praised and to establish himself as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this morning we're going to focus in particularly on the first five verses. And what we're going to do is going to be talking about something that really affects each and every one of us individually and collectively. Because one of the great breathtaking things about reading this particular chapter and any of Paul's letters really is that we become aware that they are in their very simplest form a letter from a minister to his congregation. And I say that the subject of this sermon today will affect all of us because I'm going to draw our attention to focus particularly on verses 3 to 5. And in verses 3 to 5, we hear about two qualities that are the thorn on the side of every human being. And they are the subject of a lifelong battle inside every faithful Christian. That's why Paul takes great care to spell them out. They are the two things that this chapter is designed to show us must be thrown out. Pride and arrogance. In other words, as our translation has them, selfish ambition and vain conceit. And what Paul is going to show us is how we combat them by letting the life and the purpose and the example of the Lord Jesus lead our lives from the front. He's going to show us over the next 11 verses that the God of the universe, as John tells us, became flesh and dwelt among us. He's going to teach us what it means to live like Christ in holy humility. Now, if you get a chance, it would be helpful to go back and read chapter one at some point this week, because it gives us a lot of context as to how we're going to go over the next few weeks. And as you'll see, as you read through chapter one, you'll, you'll understand that the church in Philippi was a remarkable and interesting congregation. You get a real sense of how well they're doing, that Paul says they fill him with joy. They're working so hard for the Lord that Paul is overwhelmed with joy for them. There he is in his chains in a prison in Rome and he's writing to the Philippians to tell them, you know what, even though I'm in chains, I'm greatly encouraged and filled with joy because of the work you are doing for the name of Jesus. He'll praise them for how they've partnered with him in the gospel. He'll acknowledge their fight with him against opposition that during any hardships to come, they'll tackle it with faith and grace. And as we wind our way into chapter two, we become acutely aware that all is not, the all is not well. There's some rumblings of problems in the background. And whilst there are people in the congregation of Philippi seeking to stir up love and grace and bring people to the Lord Jesus, there is a darker side going on where People aim to break, to hurt, and destroy the people of God. And that's why in verse 1, if we look at our scriptures together, that's why we have a therefore. 
You know the old rule when you're reading the scriptures, if you see a therefore, you try and go back and find why it's there. There's always a reason for it. And Paul says to avoid this disunity, to avoid any disloyalty and breaking and hurting of your fellowship, I need you to look inwardly for a moment. I want you to do a spiritual checklist. Look at your congregation, he says, look at each and every one of you and decide if you have these qualities. And he frames them as a sort of rhetorical list of questions that are set there to challenge the heart and challenge the church. We see in verse 1, he says, do you have the encouragement, or if you have the encouragement by being united with Christ? In other words, does your con congregation and yourself know what the consolation of Christ is? Are you built up in each other? Do you take joy from being the one body, serving the one purpose? He asks them, do you have the comfort of his love? Do you walk with him personally? Is he your personal saviour? Is he your protector and your shield, your fortress that you run to in times of trouble? Do you, do you let him tend to you in your every need? He says, do you have the common sharing of the spirit? Do you dwell in and let the spirit work in you? Does your aims and your views and your decisions and how you see the world take a subversive role to the needs and the desires of the Holy Spirit? Do you pray with one another and for one another? And finally, do you have any tenderness and compassion? Do you forgive others as you were forgiven? Do you tend to the needy and the widow and the poor of the people around you? Now, I'm sure that the Philippians who read this would have considered each of these things with great detail, much more detail than we've got time for this morning. But I want you to see that what Paul does is give them a kind of spiritual checklist, not just of what they need to have, but a checklist of what they already have been given freely as gifts from God. Each Christian, each born again Christian who loves the Lord will have these qualities or at least will be working on them. And more importantly, they aren't just gifts to keep to ourselves. They are gifts to share with the whole world. And actually that should be our first challenge this morning, shouldn't it? As the modern church to look at these four things and think about ourselves and where we are on that journey. If we had to receive this letter today from Paul, how would our spiritual checklist look? To what extent do we as a church and as a people demonstrate them? So perhaps this week that could be a talking point for you. Now in full knowledge that there is only so much in this verse that we can talk about this morning, I want to finally say this about it. Sometimes the modern translations of the Bible can confuse us. Other times they can be a real help. And in Philippians 2, this is one such occasion where the numbers and the verses are not very helpful because actually chapter, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 are actually one sentence in the original scriptures. And what Paul does is he says, he uses this a kind of statement where he says, if you have these things, then the next thing should happen. So in verse 2 when he says, if you have these things, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. So if you have these things, then you should have this. What he's literally done as he's lined up those individual gifts as he set out in verse 1, and he has asked that they are all done in a united way. Be one, be the same, be of like-minded, think the same. In other words, if you have all of these things, then you are to have them together. Paul says it's so important that you're not all over the place, that you don't have all these different theologies, that you don't think differently from what your teaching tells you, that you don't come up with new and wacky ways of doing things, you don't try to outdo each other. No, that is not the church of the servant king. The church is constituted as a people who have gathered from all over the world to remind the world that God loves the whole world. The unity of the church 
as we behave, how we behave as a family, it means something to the world. By this all shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In a world of war and of argument and pain and heartache and division, you, the church, your unity matters. Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be one in spirit and one in mind. Be shaped in unity. And then he says in verse 3, there's two things that will stop you being united. There is two things that are so cancerous that they will literally be the death of you. All of your work for the Lord will be done in jeopardy if you are weak enough to allow these things into your fellowship. In fact, it's worse than that. If, you, if these two things get hold of you, then you've lost your testimony. Selfish ambition and vain conceit. Now let me go on a tangent for a moment just to show you why Paul thinks these are so important. If you turn with me to Isaiah 14, verses 13 to 14, this is the story of Satan's fall from heaven. It says, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. He'll make himself like God. He'll have a throne higher than the God of the universe. He will ascend to the tops of the clouds. Yet Paul knew in full knowledge that selfish ambition and vain conceit were the two things that got Satan kicked out of heaven. That's how awful they are. And we, as the church, as God's people, have nothing to do with them. To avoid them, we need to know more about what it's like if there was selfish ambition and vain conceit. How do we spot them? And what I want to do today is explore those two things in a bit more detail. So selfish ambition, the first thing we need to know about selfish ambition is that it tells us, in fact, that we are the centre of the universe. Selfish ambition's core principle is to tell each and every one of us that nothing is better than us, that we are the centre of everything that goes on around us. The concept goes back to the beginning of history. In the 15th century, for example, there was a, a guy called Copernicus who really decided something different about the universe. After much research, he came up with the idea that the, the universe doesn't revolve around the world. It doesn't seem like such a big idea now, but then it got such a backlash. People called him crazy and said he was a heretic, a liar. There's no possible way that the universe doesn't revolve around the human race or planet Earth. There's no way that we are so brilliant that none of the rest of the universe would possibly be anything else. The rules are so constructed that we are at the centre of everything. And yet Copernicus said, no, you're not. We're actually only one little cosmic object in the whole space and vacuum of the universe. This whole expanse, we're just a small, tiny fraction. And I'll tell you better than that, he said. We don't even rotate. The sun doesn't even rotate around us. We rotate around the sun. And I think the opposition to his revolutionary theory back then tells us something really basic about the human heart, that we cannot fathom that we aren't the centre of the universe. If we don't come to that realisation, then it overcomes us completely. We become focused so much on ourselves that we forget the needs and the desires and the wants and the loves and the relationships of everyone else around us. Put it this way, and not to venture into too much politics in the pulpit. But if someone thought they weren't the centre of the universe, then they were probably more likely to accept when they've lost and someone else has had the victory. That's all I'm saying. We live, don't we, in the age 
of self. It's all about me. It's my identity, my power, my pleasure, my future. It's my self-esteem, my self-realization, my self-help, my self-promotion. Nine billion selfies were taken in 2019. But what Paul is also talking about is a special kind of selfishness. It actually, in the Greek language, is called erotheia or erotheon, and it's a specific type of selfishness. It's the kind of selfishness when you do anything to make money, regardless of its impact, regardless of how it changes people, regardless of what it does to yourself, you'll do anything for money. As my dad would say, you'd sell your granny for a score. This type of selfishness is what makes us put ourselves in the front and at the beginning of everything else. We step into a, we go our, we step into a room, we say, here I am, not there you are or there they are. It changes our behavior. This type of selfishness is about winning, succeeding, getting ahead, stepping on others to climb up this metaphorical ladder of success and then look down on everyone else. It puts us at the center of our own universe. And brothers and sisters, it is a cancer to the church. It is abundantly clear from Paul's letter that it is a cancer to the church. And then he tells us this interesting phrase afterwards, vain conceit. Let nothing be done in selfish ambition or vain conceit. I spent a bit of time this week researching this phrase and looking at all the different translations that I could find about that specific concept of vain conceit. And one of my favourite ones came from the King James Version, which calls it vain glory or empty glory. It's that, it's that way in which we attribute praise to ourselves when it's not due. Giving ourselves praise or attributing glory to ourselves when we don't have or we haven't done anything to deserve it. You get a sense that he's talking about the kind of person who cherishes their own importance. Someone who wants to be congratulated and worshipped for everything they do. The kind of person that says, I'm amazing. I have the best ideas, the best solutions to the world's biggest problems. You all need to recognize that I am the best and I think the best way for all of you. Someone who thinks that they deserve all the praise and the glory and honor that should only go to the Lord. I heard once a story recently about a student minister who arrived at his first placement ready to preach his sermon. He'd worked so hard on this sermon all week, tried his best, put everything into it. He, this was going to be the best auditory work that he had ever done. And as he entered the congregation, he rose to take the steps of the pulpit, full of confidence, vain conceit, and selfish ambition. And he got to the pulpit and he began to preach. And as he preached, everything started to go wrong. He lost his page number. He lost his train of thought. He couldn't remember what came next. He lost his voice. His projection wasn't enough. The congregation lost interest. And so off he went down, through, down the stairs of the, uh, the pulpit at the end of the service into the vestry, crying his eyes out as he approached his supervisor. He said, supervisor, what went wrong? What did I do? I had so much planned for this sermon. This was going to be the best work. I was so going to impress the whole congregation and it all went wrong. And the supervisor said to him, son, see if you had went up that pulpit the same way you come down, your sermon would have been the best, pul the best sermon you had ever preached. A sobering thought for any student minister preaching his first sermon at his first placement. Just like selfish ambition, vain glory is rife in the world. In fact, it's so rife that Paul has warned every single church about it. 
He said to the Romans in Romans 12, for by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Instead, think soberly in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to you. Or to the Galatians, he says, don't be desirous of vain conceit. Don't provoke one another. Don't envy. And I'm sure you're familiar with the love verses in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul famously declares what love is, the antithesis of vain conceit, patience, kindness, having no boasting, and so on. And it's not just the church that suffered. This has been a plague at the heart of God's people for eternity. Proverbs 3, don't be wise in your own eyes. Jeremiah told the people of Israel, let not the wise boast of their wisdom. Let not the one who is mighty boast of their strength. Let not the rich boast of their wealth. The honest truth is that vain glory and selfish ambition surround the church. And we have to look at this letter for ourselves as if we had received it today. And we need to look honestly when it's amongst us. And when we see it, we have to have the grace to admit it's there. Because, brothers and sisters, we cannot be fooled by thinking this doesn't affect us right here and right now. That the church nowadays isn't like the church in Philippi. Remember, these guys were a great church. They were doing the work of the Lord. They had passion behind the gospel. And yet Paul knew he had to keep this in check because he knew how dangerous it was. It affects us this very day. Only last week did Hillsong fire their senior pastor for these very things, for putting his self-ambition and his vain conceit ahead of his marriage and his fellowship. And as we get to this point in the scripture, we, we ask ourselves, don't we, there must be a way out There has to be a way for the church to beat these things, to overcome them. And he takes us there in the second part of verse 3 to 5. Paul says, rather, in humility, value other other people above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. What he's actually telling us is that the best way to fight against these two evils, a selfish ambition and vain glory, to fight it in our heart and in the church, we have to take the heart of the servant king. He's saying if selfish ambition and vain glory tell you to raise yourself up, humility tells you to draw yourself down. If you want to be a king, if you want to be first, you have to be last. And the thing is, this is God's way, isn't it? Turning everything on its head, changing the world from a different perspective. And it's totally against our grain as humans to be like that. It's totally against our desires to want to be the lowest of the low. When so much of the world tells us to be the best of the best. But Paul points us to the one who embodied this perfectly. The one who embodied humility so much that it was perfectly natural for him to do so. And that takes us to our second reading from today, John chapter 13. Here we are stepping into a moment in time when Jesus knows his time is almost up. You can imagine the fire crackling in the background. The candles are lit. The meal is served. The quiet of the night is broken by the laughing and the jostling of a room full of disciples. You can imagine the change then in atmosphere when the Lord Jesus raises himself up, takes a basin and a towel and goes to wash his disciples' feet. The shock the silence that must have fallen on that room. 
No, you will never wash my feet, says Peter. Because what was so shocking about this was that it was the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrating his willingness to take the place of the lowest servant. Only the lowest servants wash their master's feet. Here was the Son of God himself, the Saviour of the world, getting on his hands and on his knees and washing his disciples' feet. And we know that simple act with a basin and a towel was only mirroring or foreshadowing the ultimate act of humility that was to come when Jesus was hung on the cross. That's why he said to Peter, you don't understand, but soon you will. Oh, how far our Saviour travelled, Claremont. From creating the universe to washing the feet of his creation. From the glories of heaven to the poverty of a stable. From the golden streets of the holy city to the cobbled pathways of the holy land. From the wonderful singing of the heavenly host to the spitting and the jeering of the crowds baying for his blood. Is that not the kind of humility that we should be looking for? Is that not the benchmark, the king of kings, the one whose hands flung stars into space, reducing himself so much as to take the place of the lowest servant and washing his disciples' feet? There we are spending forever focusing on self-image or self-determination or self-esteem, self, self, self. And here is Christ kneeling before us, serving us like a servant. Humility. The best way we can be the church of Jesus Christ is to be like Jesus Christ. That's the mark of true discipleship. In other words, let me put it like this. When we have selfish ambition and vain conceit, we can see that we are never more like the devil. But Paul says, when you have this humility through unity, you are never more like Christ. It reminds me of a story of Corrie ten Boom, who was persecuted during the Second World War as a Jewish prisoner of war. And years later, she went on a tour teaching people about this very thing, the love and the humility and the servanthood of Christ. And one night she was in a hall in, in, in Munich speaking and at the back of the hall she noticed a man come in. And as her conference came to an end, she was packing the chairs away as Corrie often did. And this man came to her. Fräulein, he shouted, lifting his hand to shake hers. And she recognised him almost instantly. Here was the man that only 10 years before had persecuted her and her sister, who had killed her family, who had watched as their naked bodies were led to the chambers. And here she was faced with the choice of shaking this man's hand. Corrie says that she struggled. She didn't feel that she could even lift her hand to shake his and so she prayed, she said, Lord Jesus, help me shake myself off and put on you in this moment. If all I can do is lift my arm to shake this man's hand, give me the strength to do it, she said. And she did. She took his hand and she said there was like a power ran from her arm right through to the hand to meet that old SS guard. And she embraced him and she hugged him and she said, brother, I forgive you, I love you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Corrie ten Boom reflects on that and she says this, I had never known God's love so intently as I did then when I shed off myself and I took on Christ. Humility. Brothers and sisters, these five Short verses tell us everything we need to know about ourselves. They pour out the facts of God's gift on our life and as a people of the kingdom. They tell us that if we want to be the hands and the feet of the Lord in the world, we are to do it together. And so it calls us, does it not, to look at ourselves closely as the church. Are we meeting Christ's example head on? Are we showing 
united humility that will bring people into the light of the Lord Jesus. Do we have a heart that says, no, this is not about me? Do we have a heart that says, help me, Lord, recognize myself as a servant? Do we have a heart that says, like John the Baptist, may I be reduced so that he may be increased? A heart that says, I will step aside so that my brother and sister can step up. That him, the Lord of eternity, dwells in humanity, kneels in humility and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty. Bow down and worship, for this is your God. Brothers and sisters at Claremont Parish Church, if this is our God, have we allowed ourselves to be shaped by him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we call on your spirit to encourage us to take on a servant nature, to be more like you, to be shaped like you in the work that we do. Help us be your hands and your feet, your eyes and your mouth and your heart in the world. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. In a few moments, we'll say together the Apostles' Creed and then hear from John, who will lead us in our prayer for others. But first, let's continue to worship the Lord in our next hymn, King of Kings, Majesty. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to have kindness and compassion for one another. We ask your help as we try to follow his teaching. We bring to you our world of so much pain, so much need and sorrow. A world you care for so deeply that you willingly gave your all for it, living and dying among us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray for communities divided by prejudice, race or religion, especially at this time our Christian brothers and sisters in Ethiopia and Mozambique, killed for their faith. Bring friendship to the lonely, reconciliation to the estranged, harmony to the divided, and comfort to the bereaved. 
We pray that everyone may be valued as one of your children. We bring to you the business of each day, small in the eyes of the world, but important to us. The responsibilities of family life and parenthood, cost of running a home, the joys and sorrows of relationships. We put these in your hands, knowing that they matter to you as to us. We pray for peace, that leaders of all nations work together to this end. We pray for all those who govern on behalf of their people in every country, that they work for all and not just for the few. We would ask your blessing on your people here at Claremont and throughout the world and those who lead in teaching of your word and those who receive it. We rejoice that you are involved in our world and involved in our lives, not distant or remote, but seeking the good of everything you have made. Gratefully, we put our trust in you. In mercy, hear us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, just before we sing our closing praise, thanks again to Tom and to George and for John, John for taking part in this service. Um, and also before we uh, sing our closing hymn, there's a couple of um, announcements, a couple of notices to bring. Firstly, we did um, this week bring out a new um, edition of Claremont Calling. It's a sort of 10-minute magazine format of different things that are going on in Claremont or going on in the church. It had been sleeping for a few weeks, but it's back and back with something of a bang this week. Um, firstly, it was talking about, uh, Miriam was talking about the quiz, but that was last night, so um, you've, you've missed that. But what you haven't missed is in the um, Claremont Calling, we have got some information about some of our plans, some of our projects that are going on over the Christmas season. It's going to be pretty busy because although people still think church is closed, no it isn't. It's going to be pretty busy because we want to reach out and we want to be serving not just ourselves but people around us. And so we're looking for folks to come on board to help in a variety of, of different ways in the, in the coming weeks so that we can make Christmas 2020, not a, not a damp squib because we can't do this and can't do that and can't do the next thing, but a proper and joyful celebration and welcome of Jesus. So go and have a look at Claremont Calling and see ways that you can be involved and you can help out. We have mentioned at various points in our services that we do live in a world that is hurting and sore and, and not ideal. And we have to, with sorrow, note the death of one of our elders of the congregation in Claremont just, just this week, um, Linda McDade, who had been unwell for a while, just, but got much worse in the last, the last week or so. And after a short spell in hospital, um, Linda died on Thursday morning. We will bring to you, when we can, the details of Lin for Linda's funeral. Although, again, it will be a funeral conducted with all the restrictions that the current pandemic involves. We do commend um, Duncan and their uh, family, uh, Suzanne and Stephen and their families, um, to your prayers. And those of you who are part of the Fellowship of, of Claremont will, will know just indeed what a big sorrow one that is for us and, and what a big hole it leaves in the life of Claremont not to have Linda with us. But for her sake, um, we are glad that we can affirm that she has her place in the kingdom of God. So we conclude by singing um, a hymn of the overcoming, hymn of the salvation and the fullness of that salvation that there is in and through Christ. Love divine, all loves excelling. And after that, the blessing of the words of the grace. <laughs>